You're listening to Politics Within Reason, the official podcast of the Party of Reason and Progress. Show the world you care about progress. Go ahead, give us a like or a share. And if you want to learn more or support your purpose, visit partyofreasonandprogress.org. Welcome to another episode of Politics Within Reason. Tonight, we have a very special guest with us, Robert Mason. And Robert Mason is doing something really extraordinary, which is running as an independent in Texas for the U.S. House of Representatives. So, Robert, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. My name is uh, Robert Mason, as uh, Michael just told you all. Um, longtime Texan, born here, tried to get away a couple of times, always came back to the area. And, um, you know, just found myself losing a little too much sleep. Uh, up until you know, leading up to November two years ago, H- had to enter this race to to be able to live with myself. Yeah, that's what a, we're hearing a lot of people say is they are saying, "Look, I have to participate. I have to be a part of this." You're running a really long shot campaign, if we're honest, right? Like uh, the Democrat who got the most votes in 2016 lost by 30 points, and the independents were really down there low. I guess my really big question to you is, what do you think is going to make people connect with you? The uniqueness and in, in independence of my campaign is exactly what we're hoping is going to bring folks out of the woodwork. Uh, in addition to the statistics that you quoted there about um, percentages, uh, if you do the math, only, only about 25 percent of the registered voters in this district even bothered to show up uh, and, no, and that's interesting. vote at all. So, so uh, re- really, our, our push is to be that unique independent campaign that will draw out uh, a good portion of the other 600,000 folks that didn't even bother to show up. Yeah, this is something that on Politics Within Reason we have talked about extensively, which is that America really does need a third party, some type of third movement, because sure. with three movements, people have to compromise. With two movements, whenever one group's in power, they don't have to compromise with the other. And it's very problematic. Oh, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Just look at the stagnation that we've had up in in, up in Washington, D.C. now for decades. Right. You know, I mean, sure, the pendulum swings from one side to the other from time to time, but there's there's no real progress being made ever. I agree. And that's what really people were drawn to PORP was the the name was Party of Reason and Progress, of even though we're not in progress. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly how uh, how we found you guys. Yeah. And we're really excited to have this interview because you're doing everyone else we've interviewed has been running as a Democrat. And I can understand why I personally sure. ran as a Democrat one time, because the idea is that if you win the primary, you have a much better chance of winning. But Texas actually might be different, which is that as an independent, you might be more likely to get votes than a Democrat, where it's almost a dirty word in some districts to be, you know, in the Democratic Party. I, th- I think you're exactly right. Um, I, and I, I come from a very strong Republican background. You know, that's how I was raised in high school. I was a vice president of the Young Republicans Club. I, I, I know that side of politics. Um, as I've grown and as I've had life experiences, life has just kind of taught me otherwise. And um, I, I think uh, I think you're exactly right. I think it's really time for a third party option, um, somebody that people can can uh, even if it's just a few people that make it into the house ever yeah uh, but but they can show show an example and uh, get get America back on track to what our founding fathers really intended it to be right I mean the uh, sort of an ideal scenario is that even if Republicans and Democrats are very heavily representative neither have a majority and so that requires compromise and bringing out ideas as opposed oh, exactly. to just steamrolling the other side that's that's exactly right um, it's it's kind of funny as cliche as it is uh, as, as part of my ramping up for this 2018 campaign season I've been rewatching the West Wing on Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you could do uh, worse. It's, it's amazing. Even 20 years ago, they were writing scripts that, that clearly show politics has nothing to do with the people. It's it's one party lobbying against another, uh, trying to get their own agenda passed. But I mean, very rarely is the voice of the people uh, an important factor anymore. In, in the day and age that we live in, that's that's reprehensible. Um, we and we have the technology for, you know, to give people a voice, to give people options. We, we have have that capability and we should be taking advantage of it. Do you have any thoughts on how how is it that people could let their representatives know, hey, I really do support this or I don't? And the representative could verify that this person is actually in their district, right? Not just people calling from outside of it. You know, have you ever thought about that? Uh, I, I have. Um, and and I've, I've thought about it in, in some sort of big brotherly ways. 
Right. Uh, I was I was fortunate um, for a little while to be a defense contractor up in D.C. and uh, worked specifically with biometric security um, technologies. And you know, it's it's really in, uh, interesting what India has done in, in implementing uh, iris identification in their national ID cards. Huh. And uh, the statistics of what they've been able to do to cut back on on mafia like crime and distribution of social services is really astounding. So I think that we should at least be having a, a conversation about how we could implement those technologies, even as something as wide scale. I, I, I hate to I hate to say any corporate name, something like Facebook or, or Google, so somebody that has. Yeah, uh, the the need and the independent resources to to be tackling security on a daily basis. No, it's a good point, and I mean we saw with the you know Russian attacks on the election. Exactly, what the bots are a problem, and humans really are not equipped to be able to handle it. If we can come up with a way to let representatives really know what we're feeling, and they're able to separate it out from the bots, the FCC uh, is a really great example of this, where. They took all the bot comments and threw out all the human comments. You know, that may not have really factored much into their decision space. But the fact that so many obvious bots were leaving an overwhelming number of messages and the real humans were getting drowned out is problematic. It's not good representative government when you listen to the bots, but not the people. Agreed. And, you know, with computer technology being what it is, the, the bots can just communicate in mass. Yeah, it's not hard. It's really not a hard thing to do to write a script that just no. overwhelms a system that's not designed with the idea of bots in mind. But it's interesting going back to technology in general. Um, while I know it's problematic to get Internet in some parts of the United States, uh, much as we deploy cell phone systems almost immediately when we go to a, a third world part of the world, you know, part of the yeah. globe to assist, almost everybody has access to a cell phone today. And uh, I can tell you that, that with the the biometric security company I was I was moonlighting with in D.C., we, we had the ability to read iris identification for very secure ID purposes six years ago. Yeah, so that's a fascinating idea. One thing that uh, I don't know if you know Dan Carlin, he does podcasts and he had some pretty sure. interesting thoughts, which was right now we have a representative that represents you know, several hundred thousand people in a U.S. house district, for example, or a million maybe. But the idea is that what if you're you could train an A.I. to represent you ultimately? And it would only ask you on things that it wasn't really sure about. But maybe a lot of things is pretty obvious what you would support. And I thought that was an interesting concept. And, and you know, a precursor to that really could just be like on the big things like the tax bill, which was very unpopular. It would have been interesting if there was a way to communicate your representative. Hey, I support this part of the tax bill, but maybe not that part. They really kind of blew a chance to make something that a lot of people would have liked, in my opinion. No, no question. No, no, nobody, nobody was thrilled about Obamacare. That's right. Was and, and that was another great I point where people probably could have said, hey, we support Medicare for all, or we support these parts of Obamacare exactly. and maybe not do the rest of it. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, and, and the technology exists today that we should be able to, to do exactly that, vote for right. parts of these of these legislation legislations that are proposed because they are so lofty with the final page count on the tax bill was over a thousand. Which is funny because they always say, oh, a tax bill should be a couple pages minimum, you know, maximum, sure. right? And then, yeah, of course, they deliver this thing that's well outside what they purport to, to support. Anyway, so it, it's a problem. And I think we all get it, but we've not found a way to get around it. And like you say, the West Wing brought this up. George Washington brought this up. All the founding fathers knew that a two-party system was going to result in this problems because they'd seen it before. And yet we really haven't addressed it. No, you're, you're exactly right. And, and, you know, I think part of the problem is that once you're in it, you're kind of blind to it. Yeah. And, and you benefit from the system. And so why would you get rid of it in a sense? Right. You, you are the benefactor of a two party system. For example, it's almost certain that the Democrats are going to take back Congress in 2018, just because that's what always happens in the year, the yeah. two years following a presidential election, the pendulum's going to swing the other way. <laughs> pendulum will swing the other way, right? It's just, it's just a very effective tactic to say, "Hey, we're not Trump, or we're not Obama, or we're not Bush, or we're not Clinton." That just is what happens. And so, okay, fine. It's ultimately not going to necessarily mean there's a long term ideal in place. And, and that's problematic, right? It just means that, oh, yeah, well, we're not those guys. And so we won. And it doesn't mean that the public has solidified behind a plan necessarily. No, I, I, I think you nailed it um, with the words long term ideal. 
um, if, if you don't mind me focusing for a second. Yeah, please. What I, what I really think that we need and what is at the heart of my campaign is, is that we need a new American philosophy. Yes, I could not agree more. Uh, and, and I mean that in, in every fr- – from from you and I as individuals and in different parts of, of our – of our nation mm-hmm. to uh, to the the political structure in White House uh, on on the Hill uh, everywhere in D.C. to corporations. I mean, the whole thing just needs to be revolutionized. Yeah, and, and the problem is, uh, it's it's doable. It's doable in our lifetime. It's do I mean, easily. Uh, it's just going to take some some social revolution and, and real change at the governmental level. But I think I think Donald Trump may be I mean, maybe may the saving grace of his existence right now is that he is calling so many people to to look around and see, man, what what have we done? Yeah, that's right. I mean, his his support of Roy Moore, for example, was oh, just unbelievable. Goodness. Yeah, just sickening. <laughs> I, I, I'm it, still it, it really. Yeah, it, it was it was terrible. It, it was it, and it was just naked partisanship. And, and that yes. should cause everybody to say, whoa, OK, like we, we really have to be better than supporting somebody who is very credibly accused of being, you know, a child molester. And the police were on the lookout for him. The mall shut him out. Right. That that's not good. Yeah. But just when, because when exactly he's does that become a red flag? Right. Exactly. Like, why, why is it not already a red flag? And, and I think a lot of people were pretty turned off by it. I mean, this is a weird anecdote, but I, I noticed that in a lot of online debates that whataboutism has declined dramatically. It's weird. I don't I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that'll hold. But it just seems that the idea of, well, what about the Democrat really ran off a cliff after Roy Moore? And so anyway, that, that's just a weird thing that I've noticed. But it doesn't well, address the long term problem. And what about the Democrats? They, they they were willing to sacrifice Al Franken. Yeah, that's right. You know, like they like they they stepped up and they did it. And yeah. I know they've taken some flack for it. And and sure, maybe they deserve it. But but they did it. But they did it. And, and the GOP has yet to be able to say that. Yeah, and and I I have to say like I'm not necessarily 100 percent thinking it is the best decision, but I understand why they did it, and I think it was the right choice ultimately. As it's often been said, if if this comes down and later down the road, you know, it turns out Al Franken is in the clear. Great. We can support him. But for now, being in the Senate, it's a privilege, right? It really is. And many people could serve that role. It's not yeah. a big deal if we get somebody else in there who's also good. I, I really think at the end of the day, Al Franken took the moral high ground, uh, wh- whether or not he's guilty. And I think that he probably is. Yeah. I mean, uh, he, he clearly did some inappropriate things, right? Like correct. he clearly did. And that that it doesn't have to be a reason to get rid of somebody because, you know, his, uh, partner on the, on that tour was also doing things that could be considered inappropriate, you know, and and he's famous for being a goofball. Yeah, exactly. And and that's, and that's, and does not justify. No, it doesn't justify it. Pictures or or, or any of it in in any way. Absolutely. But, but, you know, like people, people take it too far and I've been in the military and they take it too far a lot in the military. Sure. So when, when, when you're on those kinds of tours, you do stupid stuff. Right. You know, like I've said before on this podcast, like that was a different environment. That's and I'm not saying that that makes it right, but it was an environment where people are doing things that are a little bit outside the normal bounds. And he's still not right for doing what he did while she was sleeping. Right. That's not cool. Absolutely. Not okay. (laughs) And so I think it was right of him to step down. And it could be that now that this is out in the open, if he runs again, it's at least a known factor. You know, it's a thing that people can consider. Uh, sure. when trying to choose him. It was not known before. And so, okay, fine. I think it's a, ultimately <laughs> we're coming to the point. Yes, it was yeah, a good was idea. A yeah. Sorry. We're in a violent uh, agreement here about that was a good deal. You're looking at the district. There's a little bit of a side, but I used to live very close to your district. I used to live in Denton. I, I attended the University yeah. of North Texas. Love Does your that. district go quite to the green belt? There's that little river between your district and Denton. Do you know if yours hits that? It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, okay. It, it, Basically follows uh, the east side of the Dallas North Tollway. Okay, uh, up up from North Dallas, uh, and then kind of cuts over and touches. Are you familiar with like Melissa? Yeah, a little bit north of like McKinney. Um, so it, it's it, it's it's a good district. Um, it's it's great for business. It's very represent representative of what Texas is right now. 
Absolutely. Yeah. You've got uh, Northern uh, Plano there, which is obviously a big powerhouse, yeah. financial powerhouse. And uh, yeah, yeah, I believe it. But the things you're trying to focus on, uh, I wanted to get into. So there, there were there were four big things, but maybe we'll even start with yoga. Right. So the first thing you yeah. do when you get to your page is well, I noticed that you were in a a very contorted pose. And I was very impressed by that, to be honest. Yeah. So I, I, I got kind of flexible a couple of years ago. I, I took my first yoga class when I was maybe 16, 15 Okay. Uh, mom, mom dragged me to one at the local Y growing up. It was kind of like an advanced stretching class that I did not care for <laughs> a, a, a great deal. Sure. And so, you know, fa- fast forward in uh, sometime, uh, I guess in my early 20s, uh, I, I wandered into the gym and was like, oh, yoga, I've done that before. And let's go just check it out and started taking classes more regularly. When my wife got diagnosed with uh, breast cancer a couple of years ago, not I kind of went off the deep end um, in, in doing personal research for health and really started diving down into you know, like why yoga makes me feel good and why I can sweat so much after doing so little moving for an hour. Right. right. Um, and uh, so I eventually became a, a yoga teacher um, last year and I'm working on my second yoga certification now. So you, you'll be nice and calm if you do get into Congress and you'll be able to consider things uh, you know, from a relaxed perspective and deep meditation. As, right? as calm as I can be. I, 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 Dallas traffic. I <laughs> if you remember Dallas I, traffic. I do remember Dallas traffic. There's a reason I live um, in New Mexico and it's because it is, nobody here. It is my here. least zen place to exist. And yeah. It's growing daily. But um, yeah, no. I, I definitely have become a better person um, and, and much more uh, introspective and aware, uh, conscious, I guess you would say. Yeah. Uh, because of my pursuit. So can and, I can um, I dive into this uh, this thing you brought up? So your wife had breast cancer, and that's obviously a terrifying and horrible thing. Uh, did that give you some perspective on the healthcare system? It, it really did. Yeah. Um. So uh, first of all, just uh, we caught it really early. Um. She's been given the all clear. Oh, wonderful. Uh, but we got to go through every step of finding doctors and figuring out um, which of the doctors that uh, you know friends and family recommended were on insurance. And yeah, it was, you know, it was just kind of a total nightmare. And um, while we were lucky enough that insurance paid for most of it, um, of course, there were some large bills along the way. What what really did it for me was was uh, she went and got a genetic test. Yeah. Um, so my wife's adopted, so we didn't have her specific family medical background uh, or history, rather. And so um, she tested negative for all of the known genetic markers uh, that might make this a recurring problem. Uh, and she, she was young uh, when she got diagnosed, uh, unusually young. So I really started to look at, at lifestyle and, and reading about environmental toxins and, and why these cancers you know, have sprung up so prevalently in recent years. And that got me to uh, looking at, you know, a, a lot of my own eating habits. Um, I had been vegetarian for a little while. Uh, I went vegetarian when I moved to Pittsburgh just because of access to good, fresh produce on a regular basis. Yeah, that helps uh, being able to get it. Yeah, it matters. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, well, and, and you've, you've been here. This is the land of... of <laughs> Whataburger. I do miss yeah, Whataburger. You better believe it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I just really kind of did like a whole life uh, reboot and um, I, I, I'm healthier than I ever have been in my entire life, including my military days. Um, Pretty I, I try and lead my my family by example. I, I'm, I'm the only vegan so far in the family, but uh, you know, we've definitely started looking at exactly what we put in our bodies from more of a preventative health standpoint. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So much that we fight just out there in the environment anyway. Um, that that to to pollute ourselves is just doing additional damage. Yeah, and I mean, cancer is obviously a huge shock, especially at a relatively young age. And Correct. Definitely make you reevaluate that. I, I guess the question to you is, what if you were elected to Congress? Do you know what you might support when it comes to? a national healthcare system, would you go for, you know, only private coverage, public coverage, or do you have any thoughts on that? I, you know, I, I really like public coverage. Yeah, me too. Uh, and and I, I think if it's done well, I, I think it is absolutely attainable. I also don't think that, that any particular part of a political platform is independent from anything else. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, I really do think 
that good health care in our country starts with education. Yeah, uh, that's and, fair. And really being aware of what nutrients make the adult body function better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, diabetes is a huge cost to our healthcare system. That's and, absolutely. I mean, number one on the list. And yeah, it is not all of it's preventable. Some of it you're born with, obviously, but yeah, some of it can be prevented. Yeah, just by diet alone. And so anyways, yeah, it's if we can educate people, perhaps we can one, they'll be much happier and healthier with their own life and two, save the public a lot of money. Right. And that's sure. a big deal. It really does and, matter. And just to tie a third wheel into it, throw in agriculture. We spend $38 billion subsidizing animal agriculture today. Right. But we can't find $7 billion when we need it for health care, which, which largely goes to cover problems like diabetes yeah. Which, if you look at the science, can basically be prevented by avoiding most animal products. Yeah. It, it, if you eat a lot of fatty foods, which are often meats and breads, right? And sure. you like high carb, it, it can definitely lead to diabetes. And so we're subsidizing something that ends up costing us even more down the road and without really trying to examine it. And that's kind of the porp ideal is you go through and you ask, you know, can we examine this and think through it and come up with ways to benefit everybody, right? And yeah. some things might be a clear win-win. And, you know, again, I know many people who are born diabetic. And so I understand that it's not Correct. that everybody, you know, can be prevented, but I do also know people who get late onset diabetes and they had crappy diets, right? And so, yes, there there definitely seems to be a link there and it's been proven through science and, and it's not fun for them either, right? You can lose limbs. It's it's terrible. I, I have never met anybody with diabetes that enjoyed the experience. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly 100% right. And yeah, it's it's one of, I think maybe the biggest healthcare, I'm not 100%, but it's one of the biggest healthcare expenses. A lot of it, maybe not, you know, some number of it could be prevented. And if we could do that, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of your uh, passions too is sustainable agriculture. We'll get into, uh, you know, as, while we're on this subject here, what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, but uh, just just that, um, you know, we, we overspend on subsidizing animal agriculture, uh, which not only is, is money that we usually don't have to begin with, but it just creates additional problems. It is absolutely not sustainable um, okay. from a health standpoint. Pig lagoons. But then you look at what it's doing to the environment as, as well. You know, we have two rivers in this country that really no longer reach their destination. Um, one is the Colorado, what runs dry before it hits the Pacific um, in California. And the Rio Grande uh, here south of Texas. Yep. Uh, is I live right off the Rio Grande. I live about 10 miles from the Rio Grande. And okay. it's not, not very big at where I'm at. Yeah. No. It's, it's, uh, no. And, and, and getting smaller. Um, that's right. You know, that's right. We, we invest a tremendous number of natural resources to sustain animal agriculture, which, again, is is a cause of further problems down the line when it comes to health care. And so I think that whole system just needs to be reevaluated. Yeah. And we spend a lot uh, and of. And that's not to say that I want to cut off thirty eight billion dollars worth of animal agriculture sure. subsidies and leave uh, that many farming families high and dry. I think that, you know, that money needs to be reinvested and uh, find ways to undo some of the poisoning that um, uh, chemical poisons have done to our commercial grain agriculture fields. Uh, you know, we, we need to turn some of the crops that we grow for cattle production, i.e. corn and soybeans, uh, back into you know, human sustaining uh, growth yeah. We spend a lot on crops to feed animals, right? Like there's a, you know, a pound of animal meat requires a good bit of uh, agriculture sure. to support it, obviously, in water. And, and it's become so homogenized that, you know, we have companies that own the DNA and they own the fertilizers and they own the weed killers. And and it's done, a, you know, tremendous, tremendous disservice to the fertile grounds that used to be there. Um, I would love to see that money reinvested in science and um, uh, find find ways to salvage that land and and make it usable again, uh, yeah. to, you know, on on a more productive level uh, than than to feed cows and pigs. So that, that seems to get into your your you know second passion here, which is the environment, right? You know, you're talking about making this land a little bit back to where it was. Do you have any other like thoughts on the environment at the moment? Is there something you would do differently than people are doing right now? 
Yes, uh, I th I think undoing everything that Obama did in his administration uh, is terrible. <laughs> Uh, I think the EPA is just shot at this point. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's horrible to me that that's the case because it is a total absence of of, of scientific perspective on, on these problems that we have. Uh, my thought is right now, uh, we only have the one planet and um, we, we need to preserve it, be nice to it that's right. uh, in, in order to uh, maintain it because it's what supports us right now. Yeah, when people say save the planet, the planet doesn't care. It's save the humans on the planet, right? It, it's, uh, it's really save the humans. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, life, life will go on. Right, yeah. The, the planet right. will be if, fine. If, if Jurassic Park taught us anything, it's uh, you know, that life, life will go on. Yes, exactly. And, uh, but, but you're right. It's, it's the humans that need to watch what we're doing. Because we're dangerously close to uh, wiping ourselves out. Yeah, that's right. We, we... And, and you start tweeting about you know nuclear rage, uh, and that's a whole different level of problem. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. So, right. Obviously, we don't want a nuclear environment. That'd be very bad. <laughs> you know, you're talking about quality of life, too. It's one of your other passions. And one of these things would obviously be if less people had diabetes, quality of life goes up. Sure. Is there any other part of that that you have a passion for? Is there anything you want to focus on if you were elected? You know, uh, a lot a lot of my speaking out loud starts to sound socialist. Um, and, and a lot of it, you know, it has social benefit as the root core. But I, I, I think uh, I think it would be dangerous not to talk a little bit about the future of capitalism as well. OK. Uh, and and how to nurture an environment that can be both cooperative to uh, the human race uh, at a global scale and uh, and competitive to drive free market at the same time. Yeah. I mean, as AI improves, this is clearly going to be problematic. And I'm I am concerned that Congress is so old, has no interest in this that we see right They're They're interested in this petty fighting and nobody's really thinking about what it looks like when the AI can drive everything. You know, yeah. that's a lot of jobs. Look at what we've done uh, culturally in the United States. We, we sold manufacturing overseas 40 years ago. Yeah. And we have built an, an intellectually based society. And that's wonderful. So many jobs are becoming uh, roboticized mm -hmm. and, and are now mechanical that what's what's going to happen? Uh, you know, the, the next evolution of programming is that nobody's going to have to know how to code. You're just going to be able to talk to your computer and the computer will write programs itself. So what happens to all the folks that we've been producing uh, as computer scientists and programmers? For the last few decades, you know, yeah. there's, there's going to be a tremendous glut of intellectual capability on the knowledge. Uh, I'm sorry, on, on the market, uh, and in uh, low capacity to employ them. Uh, because they've been replaced by AI. That's right. I mean, we saw in the 90s and 2000s, I guess even 80s, you know, the people who had said, hey, I'm going to be a manufacturing person. I'm going to work in a factory. Well, they, they were in for, unfortunately, a bit of a surprise as a lot of that yeah. went overseas, as you were talking about. And we may yeah. find the same with intellectuals. Uh, lawyers, for example, you know, a lot of things can be done pretty automated at this point. Uh, when sure. it comes to researching laws and they're having some trouble getting hired. So, yeah, these people who trained and were told, hey, this will be a good job market may suddenly find themselves, you know, without a job. And that's what do you do? And I don't think Congress is thinking about that. No, I, I don't think they are at all. Uh, and I think if you get back to this, this idea of a new American philosophy, yeah, I, I think that you can find answers in in the the bird's eye view, if you will. If if we focused more on on internal growth and, and internal progress strategically and focused less on screwing with the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that we could get there pretty fast. You know, set set a goal to set an example for globalization and really turn, you know, internal. And and so maybe maybe you create a tax system that's not based on uh, competition and what you're able to earn, but what you give back to society, uh, you know, it, it, it would it would uh, drive corporations to set up their own nonprofit divisions to hmm. to clean up after their factories, uh, assuming we can get some of those reopened in the United States, um, and and to do better for the environment where they you know may produce toxic waste today, you know, like let them literally pay it down with their own money. Uh, the the problems that they're currently creating it, it, it creates a system of accountability, but also a measure to clean it up as well and fix it. Yeah. And it builds a sense of community. Right. And I think I think one of the big problems we have in America right now is that we kind of all hate each other, you know, on some level. Sure. And 
I think this sense of community is is really fractured. You know, it's not that, you know, if you look through time, it's not that there's always a sense of community, but there is maybe a sense of America is awesome. Uh, and I'm American. So, you know, if you're an American, the two, that's cool. It's not exactly that simple. But right now, we really are kind of at each other's throats constantly and just trying to piss each other off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the sense of community is is not there because, yeah, like you say, the jobs just get shipped overseas. There's no real loyalty. And so what you're suggesting is interesting in that what if we can have a new American philosophy, which is, you know, related to the idea that we are Americans, you know, we kick ass and we're going to take care of this place and that yep. not loot it all the time, which seems no, to be that's, the. that's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. And, and, and drive innovation with, uh, you know, based on, on new ways to improve society, new, you know, new ways to clean up the globe. Yeah, and then uh, you know, once once we've got it fixed internally, let, let's export that. We came out at the top of World War II. You know, right. we've, we've been the global superpower since that time. The problem with being at the very top of your game is at that point the only thing you can kind of wait around to do is get knocked off. Yeah, and, China's doing and a good that's job right now. Where I feel that we are right now, uh, especially politically. Yeah, I feel like Trump has uh, exacerbated that. Like, especially like, let's take the North Korea situation. He's basically said, "Oh, it's China's problem." You know, I think I think it is going to be China's problem, and whether it should be or not, uh, we've decided to just you know get it to China. Pakistan is talking about switching their currency over to you know Chinese currencies away from the dollar. You sure. Know, I think we're I think we are just giving the world over to China uh, willingly, which is. Bizarre to me as somebody who grew up in the 80s with Reagan, you know, when America really was on top and we defeated the Soviet Union without a shot. That's astounding, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, then, no, I, I know I know Reaganomics is a, a questionable subject. Absolutely. It's a, it's a touchy subject, I should say, depending on who you speak with. Um, but but you're right. I mean, we, we effectively won the Cold War uh, and we did it through a lot of bullshit and spending. Yeah, we spent a lot of money to win the Cold War and it made America pretty prosperous to do it. You know, I'm not... It, it, it absolutely did. Uh, it, but the question is, is it is it sustainable? Yeah, that's right. That is the real question. And at some point, if you're not actually fighting a real enemy that you can win against, you know, you should be focusing your efforts in a way that you can win. Yeah. And I think that's what you were pointing I, I think, out with agriculture. I think in part, Trump needs a new war to pop up. You know, his only claim to fame thus far is a is a higher stock market. Um, yeah. And I don't know that he can really claim that because it's been going up, you know, since 2008. Right. Basically. And the danger of claiming it is that if it ever goes down, you know, then he's he's SOL. Yeah, so, exactly. So, so he needs the military industrial complex to ramp up and start spending. He, he needs Americans to get scared and start putting bomb shelters in their basements again. And start spending money. And and that is not the lesson to be teaching and certainly not the economy to want to spearhead for long term, sustainable uh, growth and greatness in our country. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, uh, uh, Vandivar Bush, I think is his name. He was the guy who really pushed for huge government spending dr during World War Two. And it turned out that that was very successful. The uh, you know Manhattan Project, the B-29 Project, all these things ultimately led to results that, you know, could be interpreted as, you know, you, you can you can legislate whether we should have done this or not. But America did come out on top of World War II. And a lot of that was due to government spending. And then we kept doing this big government spending on projects. We went to the moon. You know, we invented the Internet. Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of but, but you vaccines. Know what? It, it, it was like a national goal. That's right. We had we're, national we're have yeah. an American identity. We're going to be right. you know, the first to put a man on the moon. What 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 if we did that again? What what if we decided we, we were going to be like the first net zero polluting country country on the planet? Right. I mean that's what Germany's doing, and I, I believe that they are taking some pride in that. I mean I don't I don't live sure. in Germany, but it does seem like something that they tout all the time, and I think they're going to be very proud of themselves if they get to that point. And yeah, rightfully absolutely. so. <laughs> so I agree with you. We, we, we've we sort of decided – I mean we're never going to be everything coal-powered. You're not going to buy a coal-powered you know, Ford no, F-150, right? That's insane. Right? That's insane. It's insane <laughs> that the current administration is ramping that back up. Right. And, and there will be – I guarantee there will be less coal jobs at the end of Trump's administration than there were at the beginning, right? That's just sure. what it will be. And it's dying. 
And so, yeah, why, why aren't we setting national goals that we can be really proud of? I mean, we've, we've sort of brought the ozone layer back through worldwide, yep. you know, action. That's astounding. That's right. acid, yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> acid rain has become less of a problem, if, if at all. I, I haven't heard it in the news in a long time. I remember growing up, it was scary. We had it on Channel yeah. One in school, right? <laughs> you know, acid rain is destroying everything. And, and now it's, it's not really – doesn't seem to be much of a thing because we've put – you know, restrictions on coal plants and other things that have cleaned up the environment and yet we've still become prosperous, right? Yeah. Okay. Enough of my rant there. Um, no, no, I mean, it, 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 cause, because for, for that success, now we're living with an administration where you can't say the word climate. You no, know, it's, it's so bizarre. It's, it's like a taboo word. Yeah. And, and it just doesn't make sense. And they're successfully conflating weather and climate. You know, it's just because it's cold doesn't mean that things aren't vastly out of whack. I mean, I mean, I'm here in New Mexico and it hasn't really snowed this year. And that's weird. It is very bad around here. We should have a good bit of snow by now. And it hasn't. Sure. You know, it's it's everything's kind of out of whack. And when, so, did, did I hear it was warmer in Florida a couple of days ago than it was in Alaska? Yeah, that's right. And it's warmer in uh, Texas or it's, it's warmer in New Mexico in the mountains than it is in Texas right now, which it really should be exactly the opposite. And it snowed in Texas more recently than it has here in New Mexico. And so anyways, it's very, very bizarre. And yeah, like you say, I think Alaska has been warmer than Texas and Florida, which is, yeah. again, that doesn't, that's not bizarre. right. That's bizarre. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah. And it's something we should care about because we, if minimally, we just have a lot of real estate along the coast because that's where people settle. And we've seen historically that communities along the coast get wiped out during major climate sure. change. Sure. That's a lot well, of money. Look, look at the, the single tsunami uh, in Thailand. What, uh, 10 years ago now? Yeah, I think it's been about 10 years. Yeah. Took, took out like a quarter million people. Yeah. In, just in a minute. Yeah. Extreme weather, you know, has consequences and we should care about that. And, and yet with this administration, as you point out, just you can't, you, you, you can't even, you literally can't say the word. Yeah. So you're running as, again, as I, I want to, I really want to stress this because you're running as an independent. I think you're the only independent running. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. So, no others have popped out of the woodwork. Um, the Republicans have three. Yeah. Um, have three they have registered. Um, the Democrats had five, I think at my last count. Okay. And the libertarians have two. Okay. Uh, I'm running as an independent, uh, with the support of the, uh, the green party. Okay. Um, and then uh, another another group out of California that, that really got me interested in running to begin with, uh, the Humane Party, which is a group of uh, like-minded vegans uh, that got together and, and want to save the world. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it's it's not likely you're going to win. I don't mean this in a bad way. I just mean that I'm, I'm impressed you're yeah. running, right? I'm very impressed that you're running. And um, what if, I want to point out... Can, if we can educate people along the way and just open some eyes... Yeah, there's a there's a better way, and we're not locked into this bizarre paradigm, yeah. uh, bipartisan system that we're all sucked into. Uh, I'll consider it a win. Yeah, and and trying to get at is that you might be able to move the Overton window, right? This Overton window is this concept that the ideas that are acceptable fall within a window, and people exactly. outside on the left or outside on the right, you know, let's not, let's not just limit ourselves there, but outside that window, they come along, and and maybe eventually some of those folks can move that window in a different direction. And I love the direction that you're trying to get people to think, and yeah, I, I, mean, I hope would, you're successful. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I tried to run for Senate one time and I did a, a horrific job and I got, you know, <laughs> nowhere with it. I didn't even make it to the primaries. But the point is that the one issue I really cared about, uh, which was at the time was the SOPA and PIPA bills, which were really going sure. to uh, take down the Internet. I thought people paid attention. I was willing to run on that. And so I got what I wanted, which was those bills dying, you know, uh, you know being snuffed out. You know, I hope you win. Let's put it this way, right? I really do hope you actually win. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. <laughs> but if you don't, if you are able to influence people's thinking, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I, I would consider that a moral victory. And, yeah, um, I would take that just as well. Yeah. And so, I, one question to you is: What are you doing to reach out to people? How are you getting people to know about your campaign? I'm really curious well, about that. So, so a, a lot of the philosophy that I've kind of pitched you in the last few minutes here, um, Michael, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very Eastern in nature. Um, it, not, not so much like De Descartes, like Western Civ philosophy, but it's, it's really more lifestyle based. Yeah. 
Um, and it's and it's very um, Vedic and yogic in nature as well. So what, one of the things that we've been doing in the campaign as we got off to the start in the fall uh, was uh, yoga in the park and choosing a different uh, park uh, around the community uh, every weekend that uh, weather allowed. OK. Uh, and and um, open it up uh, publicly to to let you know nearby residents come and just do a yoga class with us. And, and just, you know, talk about the environment and talk about, you know, just being aware of, of your actions and the important and, and speaking your mind and, and uh, you know, owning up to who you are and who you want to be. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of, of what the campaign is about. And that's that's a lot of where the yoga comes from. Um, so that's that's been a big step. Um, our goal for 2018 is to have uh, one major speaking event in the area every month and to be doing everything that we can to, you know, to get the word out. Uh, and, and drive some attendance at those types of events. Um, and uh, the, the demographics of Texas District 3 have, have really changed a fair amount recently. Uh, there's been a tremendous uh, Eastern influence uh, in the population. Yeah, that's and right. I, I feel like they're they're really very underserved. And so if I, if I can touch a note to those folks, uh, and and to you know, others that are just disenfranchised with the bipartisan system we've got right now, yeah, and get them to come out and vote. Um, you know, it, it's really not a huge number that we need to mobilize. It's just a matter of getting the word out and letting them know that we're here. Yeah, just just knowing that you exist is is so hard, right? Just getting that message out there that hey, I'm here. You should look at me and sure. see what you think compared to the other folks is is so hard in, in a candidacy. And well, and the, the, the front running GOP candidate, I, I, I've, I've heard you talk about money raising issues on, on yeah. previous podcasts, and yeah. I can totally relate to that. You know, the the front running GOP candidate raised over a million bucks the first night that he was hosting folks uh, in, in his home. Wow. You know, and it's uh, that's a Ugh. tremendous amount of money to compete with. Yeah. I mean, that that money lets you uh, get yard signs out there. It lets you organize that's, within the community community. It lets you have full time staff that can reach out. Right. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. I, when I, I spent my money all trying to get uh, people to collect signatures. Right. And I didn't even get enough signatures. And so, yeah, the money part, it's a killer. And. People who want someone like you to win are going to have to give money. And I, I hate it. Right. We all do. None of us like that. But no, that's the reality. Right. <laughs> you're you're right. going to have to go donate. And if you do like this interview with Robert Mason, you should go to his website and you should donate to him because <laughs> he's not going to win if you don't. And so what's your Thank website? You yeah. Look, it's <laughs> just the reality. Uh, what's your website? Uh, www.robertmasontx.com. OK, so, yeah, you should go to Robert Mason TX dot com and you should give him money if you like what you heard here. And, you know, I I don't like doing this, but at the same time, it's just reality. And if you don't, the thing is, the people that you disagree with, they understand this and they give money and they make it happen. And that's where we're at. And it is a winnable district. It really probably is. Like I'm looking at the number of voters. You probably could win this thing. Yeah. There, and, I mean, there, there is a real statistical chance that it could happen. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting my time. I, I mean, I'll be honest. This this is such a red district um, that, that you pretty much know how it's going to go. But yeah. with with Trump irritating uh, yeah, you know, everybody a little bit more every day. Yeah. Uh, you know, there has to be some disenfranchised uh, voters. Here. Right. If you can't bring yourself to vote for the Democrat, you know, look at the independent. Right. Look at the person who is really out there has some different ideas and see if that works for you. Right. You're right. Very, very few people I know voted for a candidate in the last election. Right. They voted against somebody. They all voted against. Yeah, you're right. Hillary Clinton. That they saw as the bigger evil. And um, our, our goal is to give them like, you know what? This this guy has like real interest in seeing the world be a better place. I, I can get behind him. And yeah. um, I, I would I would love to to champion uh, the attitude of those folks up in Capitol Hill. That's wonderful. So I really appreciate your message and I appreciate you trying. I know it's hard, like from personal experience and you actually have a wonderful message and whether win or lose, I hope that people are listening to this and they're considering how it could be applied to Congress in the future, right? They should be thinking not just about who my tribe is in politics, but what I actually want to see happen. And so yeah. all the best it, of it, luck. It's really about big picture. 
Yeah, that's right. The big picture and a new American philosophy, right? Something different than just <laughs> I only vote Republican or I only vote Democrat. And I only show up when I'm excited. Like, that's not useful, right? What's the what can we do? But we can do better. That's what I want to get to. That, you're exactly right. We, we can be a better USA. We can be a better USA. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robert. And Michael, thank you for thank taking you so your, time. your time. Have a wonderful weekend, sir. You too. Take care. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye bye. Hey, Nation. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to give us a like, share, or a comment. If you like what Corp is doing and what you hear, why not consider becoming a supporting member? Help us do more. Join today at partyofreasonandprogress.org. The Party of Reason and Progress is a registered IRS 527 organization. Contributions made to Corp or other IRS 527 organizations are not tax deductible. Politics Within Reason is the official podcast of the Party of Reason and Progress.